We bless your name, O Most High. We pray that you will hear our voices joined with the voices of the elders in heaven, saying, Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord God Almighty. We seek your comfort today as we navigate this broken world. We ask you, El Nekoma, to wrap your arms around us. Amen. Today's devotion is God's Arms of Comfort. Our verse of meditation is 2 Corinthians 1 verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. No matter what emotions you experience today, God's message to you is, I will comfort you. You need not search for solace in Satan's vineyard because I am your comfort. All comfort memories are stored in two little almond shaped structures in the center of our brain called the amygdala. These glands process and store our emotions and memories. Their primary function is emotional responses, including feelings of happiness, fear, anger, and anxiety. The amygdala also ties emotional meaning to our memories, reward processing, and decision making. This is where the comfort response is activated in our brain. If you have ever met a child who is drawn to a particular blanket or sucks a thumb or finger or is in love with his or her pacifier, then you would have noticed how engaging with this object immediately changes the child's mood. His or her amygdala has established a comfort memory linked to the object. Once a comfort memory is stored, we can always return to it. But sometimes in our human experiences, we develop attachments to things and people that are just not good for us. But there is only really one attachment that is guaranteed to always bring comfort to us, and that is our God. He alone can wrap his arms around us in every situation. So of all the comfort memories you may store, hold close to the comfort of your God, El Nekoma, the God of comfort. In 1 Kings chapter 18, we see the prophet Elijah at the peak of his ministry. He is a star in what theologians call the showdown on Mount Carmel. Here, Elijah challenged the then King Ahab to bring his 450 so-called priests who were Baal worshippers, as well as the other 400 who socialized with his idol-worshipping wife Jezebel, and they were to meet him at Carmel. Under the power of the Holy Spirit, Elijah rebuked them all. 1 Kings 18 verse 21 reads, How long? Halt ye between two opinions. If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered not a word. The challenge was, get a bullock, cut it in two, and put it on the altar. Then we will see whose God will accept the sacrifice by sending fire from heaven. First up were the false priests of Baal. After much drama and prancing and dancing and even cutting themselves from midday to evening, there was no fire. They were humiliated and exposed as frauds. Then it was Elijah's turn. He built a separate altar from stones that had been cut and he told the people, get four barrels of water pour it on the wood, the altar, and the sacrifice, not once, but three times. And at the time of the evening sacrifice, the prophet offered a two-line prayer to God, asking God to, one, let the people know that he is the God of Israel and that he, Elijah, was his servant, 
and second, to let the people know that there is only one true God. Instantly, the fire of God descended, lapped up the water, consumed the offering and the stones that made the altar. In that moment, the people had no choice but to bow in reverence before God. Elijah was not done. He ordered the killing of all the false prophets. And then he went up to Mount Carmel, prayed for rain to break the three and a half years drought. He came down and told Ahab, hurry home before the rain starts. And in superhuman strength, Elijah ran ahead of a chariot drawn by the king's horses. He was certainly under the anointing and running in full power. And then Jezebel sent a threat that she was going to kill him. And Elijah runs, finds himself hiding in a cave, feeling sorry for himself, so depressed he wanted to die. It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my father's, he asked. Without condemnation, El Nekoma, the God of solace, the God of comfort, appeared to Elijah. He arranged for an angel to cook him supper, woke him up twice to eat. Then God allowed Elijah to vent. He just listened. And afterward, El Nekuma assured Elijah, you are not alone. There are 7,000 others who do not worship Baal. God understood that Elijah was tired and he started to plan his exit. This is the God of comfort, the God who is still available to us today. He did not rebuke Elijah, but he nurtured him, listened to him, and then instructed him. The God of comfort, El Nukama, does not condemn us in our sadness and in our grief, but he nurtures us back to help where we can find ourselves wrapped in the arms of the God of comfort. What comfort memory have you stored? To who or what do you turn when you are in need of comfort? Have you ever found yourself in a situation so stressful that you lose the capacity to think at all, much less rationally? Your brain freezes and you are as good as dead to the situation at hand. In these moments, having a default source of comfort makes all the difference. Yet, even when stress erodes the memory of solace, El Nekuma, the God of comfort, pursues us with his comfort. Elijah was too bewildered to think he fell asleep on the cold ground when comfort awoke him with a gentle nudge and fed him. It was to a listening ear and a protective arm that God awoke Elijah. What else could we ask for in comfort? Our natural responses in challenging times depend solely on the pathways that we would have learned during times of ease. Our brain remember and our bodies respond. So we have to challenge ourselves to lean on El Nekoma, the God of comfort at all times. Let us remember that we're no stranger to him. We are his children and he comforts us in this manner. Isaiah 66 verse 13 says, As a mother comforts her child, so will I comfort you, says the Lord, and you will be comforted over Jerusalem. And we say, Amen and Amen.